This episode is brought to you by Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and your drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Embrace the season and join 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with a special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use offer code SKILLUP for 20% off plus free shipping. All right, so fun fact about me. I do not like horror. Horror movies, horror shows, horror games, you name it. I generally try to avoid this stuff. Why? Because I'm a big baby. So imagine my delight when I realized that the next game I'd be reviewing was Alone in the Dark. This is a survival horror title from Pisces Interactive. It's a remake slash reboot of the original Alone in the Dark, released back in 1992. Uh, in fact, it was actually the founding father of the survival horror genre, I believe, arriving a whole four years before the first Resident Evil game. Over time, it became a cult classic, as for many, this was their first exposure to survival horror games. As it turns out, this reboot of Alone in the Dark appears to share a similar role, acting as a sort of gateway drug into the survival horror genre. It isn't a mechanically nor narratively deep experience, but the fundamentals are sound. The puzzles follow a similar structure, but are a joy to solve, fulfilling the detective fantasy of finding clues in your surroundings and scanning your collectibles for hints. The combat is simple, yet functional, and any of the pitfalls it could have fallen into are alleviated by how sparingly it's used throughout the game. The production value is impressive as well, sporting stunningly lit, detailed levels, a surprising amount of variety in its locales, and excellent voice acting across the board. Luckily for me, uh, it's actually not too scary either, relying far more on atmosphere to keep you wound up, rather than jump scares or disturbing imagery. The game's got a few technical hitches, and the story does get a little tricky to follow toward the end, but it's a nonetheless captivating adventure with an eclectic cast of characters that really goes places. If you're into these kinds of games though, I'm sure a lot of what I'm going to say in this review will sound familiar to you. In fact, I suspect it'll fall short of expectations given the caliber of survival horror games that have released in recent years, and especially considering its rather steep price. On the other end though, the lack of deep systems and lack of frights makes this a very low stakes approachable title. If you're intimidated by the survival horror genre like me, this may act as a good entree to get you hungry for more, in much the same way the original game was for many way back when. It's Miss Emily Hartwood. There's no reason to call me anything else. She'll come and turn the world inside out. I have to make this sacrifice! <laughs> Alone in the Dark takes place in 1920s Louisiana. Don't need to be a horror fan to know nothing good happens around these parts. It follows the story of Edward Carnby, a down on his luck private investigator played by renowned World of Warcraft streamer David Harbour. And I guess he's also in Stranger Things. The other protagonist is his client, Emily Hartwood, played by Jodie Comer, who you might recently recognize from Free Guy. She's been informed her uncle, Jeremy, has succumbed to some form of mania common among her family line. Is it a curse, possession, mental illness? Only time will tell. They arrive at Doceto Mansion, where he's being treated, but immediately there's something off about this place. To make matters worse, Jeremy appears to have gone missing, so it's up to the duo to split lit up and find him while uncovering the mysteries of this haunted estate. You can choose to play the campaign as either Carnby or Hartwood. Do note you cannot swap between them throughout, nor does the story do that for you, so you'll need to start a new save to experience the other's version of the story. To be clear, it is simply another version. It's not two totally different perspectives during the same timeline of events. While you do get a complete narrative from just one playthrough, I do think it's worth going through the story with both. Each playthrough is roughly eight hours long and all the cutscenes are very different because of their relationships to the patients of Doceto Mansion. My first playthrough was with Carnby, who's kind of impartial to this whole situation. He just wants to get the job done and get paid. In that sense, you will have to suspend your disbelief a little because he's willing to go through some truly crazy ordeals for the sake of closing this case. Rest assured, it makes more sense toward the end. He's battling some past mistakes that he hopes to absolve through this, though perhaps unknowingly. As mentioned, he's played by David Harbour, and his performance is, 
as expected, very good. He actually plays a very similar role to his part as Hopper in Stranger Things. He's charismatic, stern when he needs to be, but knows when to rein things in to appeal to a patient's better nature. His nonchalant attitude toward the wild events happening around him is always amusing. You get the sense he's seen some shit and is therefore unfazed by the supernatural. You don't see this. It's fine. It's fine. Catch you later. Are you going inside the closet? Yeah. You got a problem with that? Hartwood, by comparison, has a much deeper history with the patients of Dersetto. She's clearly been here many times before, regularly checking in on her uncle, so her conversations with these characters are far more personal. Similarly, the investigation to find her uncle seems far more compelling from her side, given their connection, as the delusions he suffers from, labelled as the Hartwood curse, may one day pass down to her. Jodie Comer's performance is just as excellent as Harbour's here, though she exudes far more confidence and drive given the personal stakes involved. The only amusement I took from my visit was discovering that the young lady's drink was an old fashioned. Very astute. Is that supposed to make you seem attentive or intelligent? Whatever you prefer. There's a real noir quality to all these conversations as well, which I loved. They're often soft-spoken interrogations in a dim room, a lit cigarette in one hand, a whiskey in the other, backed by some down-tempo jazz, reminding you that this is just as much about detective intrigue as it is about otherworldly horrors. I heard you're trying to break Jeremy's promise to the dark man. Yeah. Do you know anything about that kind of stuff? No, but it makes you wonder. If he made a promise, can't he simply stand by his words? I enjoyed all the performances here, including the rest of the cast, who each have such distinct personalities, I only wish I could have spent more time getting to know them. With the exception of Jeremy, you unfortunately don't get the chance to properly learn about them, as you'll only have about two to three conversations with each of them, and rarely are they about anything other than Jeremy. They're not wandering around the mansion for you to talk to, there aren't too many collectibles that divulge you with more information, there's a patient log that you can pick up early on that tells you why they're here, and it's all interesting, but brief. I would have loved to have learned more about them, directly from them, and while you do seem to get a little extra from the alternate playthrough, I was still left wanting for more. The story really is all about Jeremy, and I was really not ready for how wacky this story gets, in both a good and bad way. It's hard to talk about without getting into spoilers, but what begins as a simple missing persons case skyrockets into a broader mystery involving dreams, psychoscience, mythology, cults, astrology, and Lovecraftian horrors. There's a mysterious figure known as the Dark Man that appears to be behind Jeremy's torment. Uh, you've got to find out what he wants, who he is, what he has to do with the mansion's curse and its ill inhabitants, as well as explore the past trauma that Carnby or Hartwood are working through. I mean, with so much going on, it was definitely exciting, no doubt, but with so many elements weaving themselves into the story, so many characters, names, locations, and terms from different cultures packed into a short eight hour runtime, it really is a lot to process. I've done about one and a half playthroughs, and to be honest, I still struggle to keep up with it all, though perhaps those with a keen eye and a good memory will fare better. The benefit to this crazy narrative, though, is that it does take you to some surprising destinations. I entered another one of Jeremy's memories. At first, I thought the whole game was going to take place within the halls of this mansion, and that is true to some degree. The estate acts as a sort of atrium from which the rest of the story branches from. You'll frequently loop back to it in order to progress, you'll study the map and learn how to navigate these halls in all its decrepit detail. But throughout your investigation, you'll also be entering Jeremy's dreams through this talisman, sending you to outdoor locations that his mind has manifested. I was really impressed by the environments here. There are some I expected, like simple streetscapes, a graveyard, a swamp, but then there are others that totally caught me off guard, like an ancient Egyptian temple. All of these locations are so visually distinct and so stunningly rendered. The volumetric lighting accentuates the rolling fog that bathes these landscapes, as well as being strategically placed to guide you through them. The game will often seamlessly transition you between the Dosetto mansion and the dreamscape 
landscape without you even noticing. Sometimes it'll even flicker between the two or snap between them in an instant. It's really cool stuff that only modern tech can allow for and it's used to such great effect here. This is a fantastic looking game in my opinion, and it does meet the standard we expect when it comes to modern AAA games. Having said that, performance is a little mixed. The full specs are up on screen, but playing at max settings on my PC with an RTX 4080 Super at 1440p, DLSS set to balanced, I was getting well above 60 FPS, as expected. Even on my laptop though, with an RTX 3060 at 2K resolution with DLSS set to balanced on max settings, I was able to hover above 60 60 FPS most of the time, though there was a fair bit of stuttering and dropping down to high settings seemed to resolve that. On both machines, however, I did experience significant frame drops upon entering new areas. There were a couple occasions the game would freeze completely and I thought the game crashed, but it'd resume some time later. I did run into an actual hard crash early on, which isn't ideal, but then it didn't happen for the rest of the game. In terms of bugs, there were a few times where I couldn't read my collectibles or couldn't switch weapons. Nothing game breaking though, and they'd fix themselves up pretty quickly without having to reload the game. So, you know, a few niggling hiccups, but generally I didn't actually have a problem with performance throughout my playthrough, so I do consider it technically sound overall. Can't comment on PS5 performance though, as I didn't get a chance to test on there. I mentioned in the intro that the game isn't too scary. The atmosphere that the visuals and soundscape create here is essentially the crux of the horror present in this experience. The trailers for Alone in the Dark gave me the impression that this was going to be like a conjuring type deal, you know, an eerie house, a weird creepy child, possessed corpses. I really thought I was gonna struggle to get through this game, and for the first couple hours, uh, I did, purely because of the sense of unease that this mansion's sinister halls engender. But eventually, I came to the realization that basically nothing scary actually goes on when you're walking around the DeSeto estate. It's less conjuring, more stranger things, and not just because of David Harbour. The only time there are enemies at all are when you're in those dreamscapes, and even then, they're all just these zombie swamp monsters uh, there's no jump scare quick time events, uh, over the top gore or anything like that. The atmosphere is what keeps you on edge. It's the thick fog, the distant silhouettes and gurgles of strange creatures. It's the lack of music. I mean, the soundscape is so silent you can hear a pin drop. To the point that what made me jump the most was the door closing behind me upon entering a room. So yeah, I think some fans of the survival horror genre will be disappointed to hear that. You know, they're probably after a really creepy experience that gets under your skin. But as someone who's avoided this genre out of fear, I found it offered just just enough to keep my blood pumping without the crippling scares. Only his pallid mask shelters my remaining sanity. When it comes to the core gameplay of Alone in the Dark, it's much the same as other survival horror titles, puzzles and combat. Both of which are nothing spectacular, but they aren't bad either. They're simple yet effective. As far as the puzzles go, they're all quite similar. Typically it revolves around finding a key for a door or these jigsaw style puzzles, often missing a couple pieces that you'll also need to go and find. To do that, you'll search the surrounding environment for clues and study their contents to figure out their whereabouts. You may even need to go through older clues for hints, but thankfully you'll never have to go back too far as the game does remove clues no longer relevant to that chapter. A neat touch is that all the clues and collectibles in this game with text in them, it's all narrated. And that brilliant voice acting really makes each of them intriguing to listen to, despite how long some of these texts are. Every night the dark man stands opaque at the threshold of my room. Counting the days until my spirit spills out of my tired shape. Only his pallid mask shelters my remaining sanity. Once you've collected the pieces, you'll insert them into the puzzle and then move them around. I think you'll have a much better time here with a controller. I found keyboard and mouse implementation kind of weird. Some puzzles will have you use WASD, some will just use A and D to move and then Z and X to rotate, and others will have you use the literal keyboard arrow keys for some reason. There's just a bit of strange inconsistency in the controls here that made some puzzles feel cumbersome, and it would have been nice to be able to just click and drag stuff 
stuff with a mouse instead. Outside of the jigsaws, you'll often be asked to cross-reference images and text to find a sequence of numbers for a padlock or to input them into the talisman so you can enter a new dreamscape. Overall, I really enjoyed the puzzles. Again, I don't think it's anything new, but I did like how much it made you feel like a detective by manually deliberating through your clues to solve them. Combat is much the same in its simplicity. You'll have just three firearms by the end of the game, a handgun, shotgun, and tommy gun. Ammo is quite scarce though, so you'll need to make every shot count and target enemy weak spots to save precious rounds. Doing so will require a steady hand and patience, as each shot will bloom your reticle out drastically, so you'll need to wait for your aim to stabilize. You can throw objects to distract enemies during stealth sections or light them on fire in the case of a molotov, but you have no way of storing storing these, you basically just throw them from where you picked them up, so I never found myself using this much. Most of the combat is slow, considered gunplay. There's not a lot to it, but I think it does what it needs to. I had enough ammo that I didn't need to engage melee combat too often, but thank goodness for that, because it's definitely the weakest part of this game. You can light attack and heavy attack, there's no block or anything, though there is a dodge that sort of works. You cannot melee if you don't have a melee weapon though. And the problem with that is that you can only equip one melee weapon at a time and they have durability. Not just durability, but low durability. Like a single weapon will only last enough for you to kill one, maybe two enemies. There's enough of these laying around that it didn't become a huge problem for me, but I imagine if you do find yourself with no ammo and no melee weapon, you're gonna have to run around like a headless chicken to find one, or else you won't be able to defend yourself at all. Main problem for me is that your melee attacks just don't really connect with the enemy. You'll sort of just swing past them and deal damage. Enemies don't react much to getting hit in melee, or perhaps the camera pans too far out to tell, so you'll end up just mashing the button until they keel over. There's a few enemy types that are either very low to the ground or up in the air, and when up against these guys, uh, melee attacks just totally whiff past them most of the time. If this game gets a sequel, uh, this is something I'd like to see properly overhauled. It doesn't need to be overly complex, just tightened up a bit. One other component that could do with some work are the bosses. There's actually a real lack of them here, to be honest. I counted like two, they both happen way at the back end of the game, and neither of them are very good. I won't spoil what they look like, because, I mean, there's only two. You just shoot the monster in a tiny arena until they die. They could have involved some puzzle mechanics, more set piece moments. I know it's wishful thinking, but I do believe a lot more could have been done here, even with such basic combat. These gripes would have annoyed me and detracted from the experience if it weren't for how well paced the combat is throughout the campaign. It's used very sparingly, you're only ever asked to kill two or three enemies at the most, and it doesn't typically take place in confined spaces where camera issues might impede on it. It's just lightly peppered in here and there as a pacing mechanism to mix up the gameplay, and that meant I just never got frustrated with it. The puzzle solving and combat are functional and balanced against each other in just the right amounts that neither becomes monotonous despite their lack of depth. Trust me, you're getting your money's worth. Alone in the Dark doesn't reach for much, and for those familiar with the genre, I don't suspect it'll reach anywhere near the heights of recent entries like Alan Wake 2 or Resident Evil 4 Remake. It doesn't take many risks, uh, it isn't particularly innovative. I mean, everything I've mentioned in this review is likely present in other survival horror games, done better even. And with no memorable encounters or set-piece moments, no deeper systems to explore, yeah, I can't argue that there's enough meat on these bones to justify that steep $60 price tag, and I suspect many will feel better served waiting for a discount. But this isn't totally worth skipping, it does a decent job with what little it offers. It's a tidy experience that strips all the fluff and ensures its core elements are up to snuff. There's no inventory management to deal with, no upgrades, no gear system. The puzzles and combat work within their limitations, never outstaying their welcome to needlessly pad out the game. The production value across the board is impressive, with fantastic visuals and top-class character performances. The narrative is perhaps the only thing that gets ahead of itself, but even then, it's in service of providing a diverse experience that isn't restricted to the confines of a haunted mansion. If the OG game was the spark that ignited interest for survival horror in 1992, I think this reboot of it will do the same for some here in 2024. 
It certainly did for me. I mean, it's got me thinking about playing all those big survival horror titles I've missed, and what better way to uphold the spirit of the source material. So yeah, if you're down to dip your toe into the genre, or are looking for a familiar yet simplified offering, then I do recommend Alone in the Dark. Gentlemen, in the mood for a little bit of spring cleaning? I'm not talking about whipping out the feather duster, mind you. I'm talking about whipping out the Manscaped Lawnmower 5.0 to give that below the waist mane a much needed trim. This video's sponsor, Manscaped, is only too happy to help you take care down there with their industry leading range of men's grooming products. Their crown jewel that helps you take care of the family jewels is their Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. And let me tell you, it's got futuristic tendencies. In the kit is the all new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, the most advanced ball trimmer in the history of the human species. Your body hair will tremble in fear at the sight of it, for it knows it cannot withstand the two interchangeable blades, one of them skimming off the top and the new foil blade for a closer shave. The hair can try to run and hide, but it will not succeed, for the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra features dual LED spotlights to provide contrast on multiple skin tones. With that sort of illumination, there is nowhere for those wayward hairs to hide. That's not all though, since the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra also features three length setting combs, plus it's waterproof, making it safe to use in the shower and very easy to clean. The Performance Package 5.0 also includes the nose and ear hair trimming Weed Whacker 2.0, as well as the Crop Soother Aftershave Lotion and the Crop Preserver Anti-Chafe Ball Deodorant. Once they touch your sack, you'll never go back. Hell, Manscaped are feeling generous, and so right now if you grab the Performance Pack 5.0, you also get some Manscaped boxes, very comfy, as well as the Shed 2.0 travel bag. Spring cleaning has never been this easy thanks to Manscaped. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code SKILLUP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code SKILLUP at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. Thanks Manscaped for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.